I'm Nat West, owner and founder of Reverend Nat's Hard Cider. There are two main approaches to making cider, the beer making style or the wine making style. Beer making style is fast turnover, uh, not a lot of aging, getting apples multiple times a year, fermenting them, typically fermenting them quicker, turning it around faster, and you have much less tank space. While the wine making style is uh, annually, once a year you're dealing with the harvest, you're only getting apples uh, once a year. In the Northwest, we're very close to um, the Yakima cold storage. Uh, there are more apples stored in the Yakima Valley than anywhere else in the world. So we have great access, low transportation cost access to those apples. And the price does not fluctuate very much year round. The winemaking style, those apples are much more expensive typically because they're cider specific varieties. If you don't price your own apples, there's no way that you can make that winery style cider because those apples are, are not available in, in juice form. Cider specific apples are not available in juice. Some equipment that's specific to cideries are primarily apple handling equipment. So apples come in these very large 800 to 1,000 pound bins, and we have a bin dumper that picks up the apples and dumps them out into a conveyor belt, moves the apples into a grinder, which chops them up, and then we have a pump that squirts the pomace into our juice press, and then the press squeezes the pomace into juice, and the juice comes out, and then we can ferment that juice. Our juice press is a pretty large industrial model. We, we can do between 12 and 25 bins of apples, and each bin can be about 1,000 pounds, depending on the variety of apples. Some apples press really cleanly, and they're crisp, and uh, they don't break down into soup when you try to press them. But other varieties are a little bit stiffer. They can press, and, and, and we can get a lot more juice through them. When we're, when we're pressing, we always keep an eye on safety. That's like the biggest thing for us. Pressing apples is much less safe than any other part of cider making. There's huge equipment, very large equipment, lots of large bins of apples, a lot of repetitive stress potential. So we keep an eye on, on that. We make sure we buy really nice equipment that really makes the job easy to do. So that's, that's a pretty significant risk that we think about a lot when we're pressing apples. We do pasteurize our ciders. There's two reasons to pasteurize any cider or wine. One is for microbiological stability. You don't want stuff growing in the bottles. Any cider that's been back sweetened or has any residual sweetness in it typically needs to get pasteurized. Otherwise, the bottles may explode. The yeast will re-ferment in the bottle. It'll, it'll eat up all the sugar and the CO2 grows. And unless you have a very strong champagne bottle, they can blow up. And, we can get away with a higher pathogen load in our juice because the fermentation process destroys all kinds of bad bugs. If you're ever going to sell fresh juice, uh, you, you, know, you might want to buy the juice uh, pre-pasteurized and pre-pressed. A lot of our ciders are made with Pink Lady, Golden Delicious, Granny Smith, John of Gold. We look for bricks or gravity. We want a certain, we want a pretty sugary apple. The higher the sugar, the better the flavor. When we buy apples, they usually come cold, either from the grower's chiller or cooler or from the packing house's giant coolers, where the, they have a giant cooler and they suck out all the oxygen and they pump in nitrogen and they keep it at like 31 degrees. And that puts common apple varieties into kind of a nice stasis and they go right into our walk-in cooler. Our walk-in cooler is sized to take delivery of a full truckload of apples. But the goal is then to, to press them as fast as possible. So then once it's juiced, it's relatively stable because we begin the fermentation process almost immediately. The pressed juice doesn't sit long. Uh, fermentation protects juice from microbiological contamination. So we like to age it for a few weeks, between a few weeks and a few months, depending on the variety. Some of stuff ages for a long time. Some of our varieties go apple to bottle in six weeks. And then once it's in a bottle, though, we get that out the door as fast as possible. Our bottles have the swing top Grosch style lid. It's a big bottle, it's a 750 milliliter bottle. We crown cap it. Our pasteurizer gets pretty hot, so we use the crown caps on top. And then when we're all done, we hang the swing top off the side. And a question we get a lot is how long will it last? Most of our ciders are carbonated. Uh, I mean, our goal is really to make a cider that's delicious enough that you're going to drink it in one sitting. We don't want to people rely on these swing tops at all.
So the cost of goods for making cider are primarily are, are glass is going to be your biggest cost of bottle buying bottles. So if you can save a few pennies on your bottles, it's a great great way to do it. Great way to save money. Um, other than that, juice is the second most expensive uh, cost of goods. We can we make juice cheaper than we can buy juice. We also track our labor cost for producing juice, but we track it in our cost of goods so that we can tell if it's always uh, a good idea for us to continue to press apples. If we can, can no longer make juice cheaper than we could buy juice, then we need to take a closer look at buying juice. Some other cost of goods that you might that you might not have in in brewing or winemaking are the specific to. Um, your apple handling, so if you're buying apple handling equipment, you need to figure out how to depreciate that and amortize those costs over time. And not, you're not just thinking about the cost of the apples, you're thinking about if you're taking out loans on your equipment, you gotta factor that into your cost as well. Sometimes we get taxed as a wine, sometimes we get taxed as a cider. Uh, cider is sort of a weird sort of bastard child that doesn't necessarily have a really clear definition on the federal and state levels. Cider that's 7% alcohol and over typically is taxed as a wine. Cider that's less than 7%, so 6.9 and below, typically is taxed as a cider. If you have higher carbonation levels, that can also affect how much taxes you pay. If I add a, accidentally slightly too much carbonation, or the apples naturally produce 7.1% alcohol, I could pay $3 a gallon. So it's a huge variety, or a huge swing in, in the taxes. The way that cider is bought and sold in a given market is much different than beer. A lot of breweries, when they start up, they self-distribute. That's kind of the, the, the model for small breweries to start, is to self-distribute locally, you know, find your own accounts, find your own tap handles. But cideries cannot do that. There is not enough cider consumed in a given market uh, anywhere, I think, in the United States to live off of self-distribution. So we self-distributed for you know, two or three months before we signed with pretty big distributor. And our, our distributor choice was based largely on that distributor's geographic reach. Cideries make their living on geography. So we're not so concerned about filling in all the nooks and crannies in Oregon and in Washington. We're going to be in Idaho very soon and sell to the 12 accounts there that are just are dying for it. Most people who are familiar with cider in America think that cider is now where craft beer was 20 years ago. Um, there are some signs that, that point to that sort of uh, panning out. The, the, one of the biggest ones is uh, Greg Hall, who's the former brewmaster, and he uh, got out and is now starting a hard cider business. And he, he's one of the uh, people who thinks that hard cider is going to really, really take off in America. Hard cider in the Northwest grew 275% in 2012. There's a lot of potential still, and there's growth that's going along with it. So I just kind of shake my head whenever I hear people who want to start a brewery. And I think, wow, you should look into starting a cidery because there's a potential for it to be a lot bigger, uh, a lot more growth than, than craft beer is right now. Some of the largest breweries, uh, Anheuser-Busch and Coors, Miller Coors have debuted ciders recently. Craft Brewers Alliance just debuted one called Square Mile. I think those are our biggest allies, really, because they let customers who may have never tried cider or only tried cider once or twice, they get it into the corner stores and they get it into the, the uh, popular, like Walmart, you can go to Walmart and buy you know, hard cider now. They introduce cider uh, consumers to cider in the first place. So it's opening up consumers to the possibility of trying cider. And there's also a lot of opportunity for us to, um, to create our own little niches. So Reverend Nats is known to make much different ciders than other cideries in the area. Uh, there's, a, there's an opportunity, I think, for cideries to distinguish themselves by making unique products. But you go look at the craft beer selection and there's, you know, there's a huge range of flavors available uh, and I, I think there's an opportunity for cider to have a very large range, not just by adding flavors in, but by using very different apples and very different yeasts and very different processes. So I think there's an opportunity for a cidery to start out and to make their, you know, use their own recipes, leave their own mark that might be different than any other cidery that's out there currently.